Hello everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to the second screencast in our unit on vagueness. The first screencast introduced vagueness and tried to make you fans of vagueness in language, and it also introduced context dependence as another welcome aspect of natural languages and one that can help rein vagueness in to some degree. For this screencast, I want to try to further articulate what vagueness is all about, mainly by comparing it with some related notions. And then we'll close with a look at the famous Sorites paradox as a transition into the next screencast, which will focus on experimental work on gradable adjectives. Okay, so our first competitor notion for vagueness, so to speak, is generality. And here I just want to emphasize that vagueness is not merely speaking in general terms. Take, for example, the sentence, some numbers are prime. This is a very general claim, but it's not vague in any significant sense. Compare that with George is fast for a tortoise of his species. That's a very specific claim, but also a vague one due to the use of the vague adjective fast. Now, I recognize that there's a sense of the word vague outside of linguistics that means something like speaking in very general terms, but we won't use vague in this way in our discussions just to help try to keep these concepts separate. Our next competitor notion is prototypicality. This is often smushed together with vagueness even in technical discussions, but I think they're clearly different. So a prototype is a canonical instance of a class in some sense. And prototypes are sometimes called exemplars of their classes. For example, a bluebird may be considered a prototypical bird, at least in North America. By contrast, a penguin is not a prototypical bird. However, a penguin is still unambiguously a bird, and thus it is not a vague instance of a bird. I do think that prototypes will generally be non-vague instances, though. It's hard to imagine a concept where the prototype is also a fuzzy, unsure case of the concept. But you can see in the case of penguin that being somewhat far from the prototype doesn't necessarily imply any vagueness. For comparison, consider the cup or mug-like things on the previous page. Item 10 seems like a prototypical mug, whereas item 16 seems like a vague case in that there's likely some doubt about whether we should call it a mug at all. And item 14 is a clear mug, but not in a prototypical sense, I would say. A final comparison, vagueness versus ambiguity. This is another case where general usage often blurs these concepts together, but we want to keep them apart. So here's my attempt to do that. Ambiguities are discrete choices between options. For example, the word crane is ambiguous between a bird sense and a machine sense. There's not really a gray area between these two senses. They're just different senses. Uh, by the same light, the word tall is ambiguous between an adjective that means demanding, as in a tall order, and an adjective that describes height, as in a tall person. Both senses are vague and take on different vague standards depending on context, but there isn't gray area between these two quite distinct senses, clearly. They're just sort of different words that sound the same and perhaps share an underlying conceptual metaphor or something. Ever since Lakoff 1970, linguists have used ellipsis to test for whether something is an instance of vagueness or ambiguity. So here's the idea. For a sentence like, Chris saw a crane and Catherine did too, the ambiguity of crane might lead you to expect four possible construals. Chris may have seen a bird, but perhaps the ellipsis in the second clause could get fleshed out to Catherine saw a crane too, where crane referred to a machine, for example. However, this is clearly not the case. As I've indicated here, the ellipsis has to be resolved to the same sense as the first clause. That is, both saw birds or both saw machines, no mixtures. Compare that with a sentence like, Usain Bolt is fast and George the tortoise is fast too. As we've seen, the standards for fast are different for George than they are for Usain Bolt. And it seems like that standard easily shifts between these two clauses so that the sentence easily comes out true. Right? Even if you set the standard for humans in the first clause at like 20 miles an hour, you easily re relax it for George in the second clause. And so this confirms that the shifting standards for fast aren't ambiguities, but rather reflect how vagueness is resolved in context. As you might expect, it can sometimes be hard to tell whether you're dealing with vagueness or ambiguity. And in those cases, you'll likely have a funny feeling about the ellipsis examples too. For example, consider this attempt to report on a very bad sounding party. The beer was flat and Chris's singing was too. Does that work? Uh, it sounds a bit odd to me, which would suggest that flat as in flat beer might be a different word from flat as in flat singing. Or how about this line from the Alanis Morissette song, Head Over Feet? 
you held your breath and the door for me. It sounds sort of strange because hold as in hold your breath may be a different lexical item from the hold of hold the door. Anyway, if you now need to take a break from this screencast to listen to some Alanis, that's totally fine with me. We have just one more topic for this screencast though, the Sorites Paradox. In the Sorites Paradox, we exploit the gray area for vague predicates to construct seemingly paradoxical arguments. For example, let's focus on the adjective noonish, which means around noon. I think we can all accept the premise that 1201 is noonish. And even two minutes after noon is still noonish, and so is three minutes after. So then we're tempted by the statement that for any time t, if t is noonish, then t plus one minute is noonish. But that's recursive, and we are led directly to the obviously false conclusion that 11.59 p.m. is noonish. Now, you're probably thinking, well, of course, at some point we added too many minutes, and so we want to deny premise 7b. However, it's clearly fine to apply 7b for a while, and figuring out when you can stop will bring you headlong into the inherent vagueness of the predicate noonish. Here's a second example. Our starting point is, a $5 cup of coffee is expensive, and then we get ourselves into trouble. $4.99 is expensive for coffee, and so is $4.98 and $4.97. And so we adopt premise 8b, any cup of coffee that costs one cent less than an expensive cup of coffee is also expensive. But this will take us all the way through cheap and into free. A free cup of coffee is now expensive. That's the paradox. And obviously the culprit was again this recursion, but the recursion is fine for a little while, for some unspecified number of steps, but then at some point it has clearly already fallen apart. So beyond using the Sorites paradox as a test for the presence of vagueness, which I think we can do, how will we resolve these paradoxes? I really like this paper by Dan Lassiter from 2011. Lassiter's proposed re re resolution is essentially that we need to recognize a probabilistic aspect of this. People will assign probabilities to the Sorites statements in ways that reflect increased uncertainty, and that uncertainty will eventually turn into certainty that the statements are false. We don't need to say precisely when that happens, rather we can just observe the continuum as a way out of the paradox.